an emeritus professor at the University of New South Wales School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, John Trinder has spent over 50 years in teaching and research on a range of topics, including photogrammetry, remote sensing and spatial sciences. With numerous awards and scientific papers to his name, he is a pioneer in using remote sensing to assess the sustainability of environments and manage land and water resources. John's presentation explores how remote sensing technologies can play a role in understanding and improving our urban environments. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this event. My interest, as mentioned, is in remote sensing together with urban sustainability. The summary of my topics will be uh, the need for sustainable urban uh, systems, the characteristic of nature-based systems in green space and uh, impacts on the fragmentation due to developments by humans, a comparative study of the growth of urbanization in uh, Wuhan city in uh, China and Western Sydney, introduction of ecosystem services, then presentation supply and demand of ecosystem services, and then the contributions that geospatial technology such as remote sensing can make to the determination of uh, ecosystem services and hence sustainability. Now, firstly, the question is what a sustainable city and perhaps other speakers are going to also address that question, but populations are moving more to urban areas. So we're getting more than 50% of the world's population now living in cities and even greater percentages will be expected in the future. So we do need to some sort of indices to be able to determine what a sustainable uh, city is. And at the moment, uh, there don't appear to be any satisfactory indices, and they must consider economic society and environment and assess, and assess the effects on neighbouring areas to uh, urban areas. And the indices, uh, if they're developed, need to be able to suitable for develop as well as developing countries and consider the total environmental impacts. Now, there are considerable benefits to having green spaces uh, because it's an essential component of sustainable cities. And it's evidence has shown that it reduces blood pressure, heart rate, stress, and incidence of health risk. And tree cover provides the psychological restoration. So low levels of nature dose, the dose from nature, result in poorer health or uh, mental health and uh, lower levels of social cohesion. And the suggestion as far as green space are concerned are areas of a half a hectare to one hectare, and they should be, uh, say, threshold distance of 300 metres from urban, those people living in the, the urban areas. So firstly, let me just mention a few things about remote sensing data. There are three types of remote sensing data. Firstly, there's the optical systems, uh, which uh, like a camera, uh, spatial resolutions vary from hundreds of meters, that is the ground sampling distance to as small as 30 centimeters and potentially less than that. They record in the visible and infrared regions of the uh, spectrum and revisit times may be important, but they may also vary significantly uh, between the different systems. Uh, obviously, if you want to monitor the environment, you need regular revisit times. They started off about 20 or 30 days, but these days you can get revisit times down to one day or less. Then there are radar imaging, which are active systems. They operate in the microwave region of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, and they uh, become in what's called XCL and potentially P-band, and they have potentially four different polarizations. But radar requires a significant level of processing to be able to uh, extract information. Then there are LIDAR systems these days, which are laser scanners, uh, uh, either from uh, aircraft or drones, uh, will give very high sampling intervals uh, in multispectral bands and visible infrared regions. And the platforms are also important. Uh, that is whether it's coming there, the sensor is on the satellite, aircraft, or drone, which is also referred to as RPAS. 
one of the first uh, satellite images that became available that we call high resolution is one meter, one meter resolution in panchromatic and four meters in color. Uh, there are much higher resolutions these days uh, that are available, but this was the first one. And the 1999 uh, year is sort of significant uh, in terms of what I'll be discussing shortly. Then we look at radar images and they look very noisy. Uh, you, this is actually centered in Cairo. And in the insert there, you see the pyramids, for example. But radar is difficult data to deal with uh, and it's often expensive. But potentially it will be used much more in the future because it can see through cloud and it can image day or night because it's an active system. Now we use Landsat data for our st uh, tests over urban areas. And the reason we did that is because we have a continuous series of uh, Earth observation satellites ranging from Landsat 5 to Landsat now, Landsat 9. The data is free and it gives us a very good coverage uh, over a period of 30 years, which is really what we wanted. While we'd like higher resolution uh, images uh, than Landsat, which is 30 meter resolution, the, the high resolution data only became available in 1999, as I mentioned. <clears throat> now, of course, we have high resolution satellites, but we wanted to have uh, a review of the developments on land cover over a period of 30 years. And <clears throat> only Landsat gave that to us. So because the resolution was at 30 meters, <clears throat> which is limited for urban applications, then we had to improve the resolution by a process to super resolution. So we chose in our study, uh, comparing uh, Wuhan and Sydney, we took seven scenes uh, in the period 87 to 2017 uh, for Wuhan and Sydney to 1988 to 2017. We did a standard classification technique called multiple end member mixture uh, spectral mixture analysis. Uh, then we set up a library of op op optimum spectra and <clears throat> we selected four uh, uh, area, different types of areas that's built up because we're really interested in the effect on uh, build up areas and vegetation, uh, but we also extracted soil and water. And then we did a study of the fragmentation of the area, and this was using a software called IndiFrag. It came, uh, IndiFrag it came from Spain. Uh, and we investigated things like object size, uh, number of objects, uh, and uh, nearest uh, neighbor, et cetera, the whole series of uh, the statistics can be analyzed. And in Wuhan, we found that uh, the uh, building areas uh, and uh, vegetation areas increased uh, over the period. And the higher density of vegetation compared with buildings suggested a higher level of fragmentation in the vegetation. So this impacts on green space for the urban areas. So some areas had reduced uh, uh, ratio of uh, vegetation to building of less than 15%. Uh, and this has a significant in impact, as I'll mention, when we start talking about ecosystem services uh, due to the, the urbanization in Wuhan. In Sydney, it wasn't so much because there's a lot of development been, uh, going on in Western Sydney. So the size of building is vegetation significantly larger than they were uh, are in Wuhan. The ratio of the number of vegetation to buildings are not less than 50% uh, overall in the area. Uh, the type of development, of course, has long travel distance because we live in individual houses. But the impact on ecosystem services is only about 3% for these uh, developments in Sydney. Now, I introduced ecosystem services, and this has been uh, in the literature for about uh, 30 to 40 years. Uh, and they are uh, those services provided by the natural environment and properly functioning ecosystems for the benefits of humans. They demonstrate the ex extent of dependency of humans on the natural environment. And there's a, there's a significant paper 
uh, by Costanza and, and et al. in 1997, where uh, the uh, 17 ecosystem services across six, 16 biomes, biomes were uh, listed. And I won't go through them all, uh, but these are uh, important uh, lists of the ecosystem services that humans depend upon uh, for our existence. We have natural capital, which of course in, comprises trees, minerals, ecosystems, manufactured capital, which machines and buildings, and human capital, which of course comprises humans, individual computers, etc. And now the natural capital involves flows of material and energy and information from natural capital stocks. And this is combined with manufacturing human capital services to contribute to human welfare. Human well-being is dependent upon interactions between built, social, human, and natural capital. Uh, and an increase in building in urban areas can cause reductions in ecosystem services, as experienced in our studies, particularly uh, in Wuhan. And I ask the question, how to assess the impact of losses of ecosystem services on the well-being of humans? Just briefly, global uh, value of ecosystem services have estimated to decrease by $20 trillion per year uh, between 1997 and 2011. This is uh, obtained from the literature. Uh, and another study in China showed that uh, uh, a 13 percent loss in ecosystem services due to construction in Dongying, and our our figures have shown similarly some losses in ecosystem services in Wuhan. So how how can ecosystems be applied to determine sustainability of urban areas? The researchers of uh, EU have made a report uh, about assessing ecosystem services. And they say that a pristine urban <coughs> ecosystem against which to judge results is not credible because we live in an environment and there's not simply an ecosystem there that's perfect for us to compare. So they say a good ecosystem is one with good quality air and water, sustainable supply of ecosystem services, species and habitats. And with a high level of species diversity and a balance between green and build up space. So it seems like the recent publications, these ones here, have been used for assessing ecosystem services, uh, and uh, they comprise uh, the, the lists in the, this table here, uh, particularly uh, the, the ones providing food, fiber, water, and then regulating services. Uh, <clears throat> the regulation of those, those functions, uh, cultural services, and then the supporting and habitat services that are necessary for all, for all other ecosystem services. So a sustainable, a path towards sustainability uh, uh, will in involve the interdependence of ecosystem services and human well-being and diversity. And so we need a collaboration uh, be, uh, in this this interdisciplinary area of ecosystem services, and we need advice to decision makers on the science of ecosystem services to ensure that uh, the appropriate decisions are made, uh, and we need to ensure that we have and are maintaining societal goals in these decisions. So this paper here by people from Europe, uh, Brook, Bookard and Adal, determined supply refers to, of ecosystem services, refers to the capacity of a region to supply a service, while demand is the amount of actually consumed by uh, humans in this area. And these are combined to, to form what they call ecosystem footprint. Uh, and then they define ecosystem integrity the preservation against non-specific ecolo ecological risks, which are the disturbance of self-organizing capacity of ecosystem to manage the, the risks. And so eco ecological integrity is determined from the provisioning, regulating, and the cultural services which have been listed previously. So in their study, they used uh, for uh, determining the 
uh, uh, supply and demand of ecosystem services. They use the Corum database, which is a, a GIS database, uh, together with the potential indicators and relative capacity to supply ecosystem services. And sustainability can then be determined compared with ecosystem demands against the supply. And in the study in Germany, they found that in some cases, supply exceeded demand. On others, uh, demand exceeded supply. And so changes in energy supply and demand as a result of changes in fossil fuel to renewal in, uh, resources was one factor in uh, affecting the uh, supply and demand formula. In the literature in remote sensing, there have been a couple of papers by uh, this person from Sweden where they investigated some high resolution satellites. You see Iconis mentioned again here, studying the changes in urban land cover over Shanghai uh, from 2000 to 2009. Uh, and they looked at the capacity and supply and demand of ecosystem services uh, in, in this area. And similarly, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the same authors uh, investigated uh, the European Space Agency Sentinel-1, which is a radar system, and simulated Sentinel-2, which is an optical system over the city of Zurich. Uh, this is back in 2017. Uh, and they estimated the ecosystem units, uh, which were assigned per hectare, according to uh, a number of geometric factors, uh, which were extracted for the land cover uh, uh, descriptions. Now, another study uh, was in uh, that I found were in was done in Havana, uh, in Cuba, to investigate the supply and demand of uh, food and also recreation areas. And land use was derived from uh, Google Earth, uh, uh, which uh, is derived from remote sensing data uh, and also residential patterns were derived from open street map. So what they did was uh, they wanted to find out whether there were mismatches between <clears throat> the demand for food and recreation areas uh, against the uh, supply uh, of those uh, necessary requirements. And so they assessed how much and where the flow uh, was unsustainable. Uh, and so they actually had this little table here where they talked about the capacity uh, <clears throat> and the flow and the demand. And here we have unsatisfied demand for uh, certain services uh, that uh, were to be provided. And in fact, they found that uh, the, uh, certainly as far as some of the supply, uh, they, they said the demand for food should be based on at least 45% of requirements. Uh, and the question was how far away were recre recreation areas from the residential. So they found certainly there were, uh, in both cases, there they were supply mismatches. In other words, inadequate supply for the demand. Determining ecosystem services uh, using remote sensing data these days uh, can be done on a repetitive basis. We now have the high res resolution satellites, as I mentioned with pixels, down to 30 uh, centimeters on the ground. They have repeat coverage, uh, and I can't list the number of remote sensing uh, images uh, or satellites that are available uh, because there are many, many, uh, and uh, <coughs> they're developing all the time. Uh, so it, they are available for assessing, for example, supply of food, fiber, and water. Uh, they can be under uh, the assessment can be undertaken on a regular basis due to popula population changes, environmental factors. The rapid changes in technology will be uh, enable automatic collection of ecosystem service on an almost daily basis in the future, uh, and this is uh, because of the improved. Uh, resolution uh, and uh, and coverage of satellite data. To sum up, then, urban developments are significantly impacting uh, the biodiversity and human well-being by fragmentation of habitats and reduction of ecosystem services. 
the assessment of ecosystem service should enable determination of these impacts and decision makers must assess the impacts of developers on ecosystem services. So I would suggest that urban sustainability should be achievable in terms of supply and demand of ecosystem services and remote sensing technology will make important contributions to the determination of uh, urban ecosystems in the future. And the question still remains how to assess the impacts of losses of ecosystem services on well-being of humans on a really coarse scale. Uh, you can say that uh, uh, if you lost all food, then you know that's impacted uh, on the people. But otherwise, small changes in ecosystem services are difficult to assess. Thank you for your attention.